morning, Woods Edge. I have literally been counting down the Sundays that have the opportunity to open God's Word with you. I have so much admiration for the ways in which God is using Woods Edge here locally, but around the world. And it begins with your amazing pastor, Jeff Wells. I hope you all don't mind. I'm just going to adopt him as my personal pastor, if that's okay with you. I just love this man and his wife, Gail, so much. Uh, I write about it in my book, Unleashing Peace. I wish I could teach on it this morning, but Jeff has practiced one of the most important ministry principles in Audrey in my life. He's practiced the ministry of presence in our lives and has ministered to us so significantly. There's no doubt in my mind um, that God's hand is all over your pastor. And I've just had a wonderful time com- uh, just joining forces with the whole team here the, in the last week. I just, it's been an amazing experience. I, I just appreciate uh, the impact of this church all around the nation. In fact, your pastor is known internationally. I got a text this morning from a pastor in Sydney, Australia. He said, is that that pastor that's a runner too? And I said, yep, it sure is. And so uh, your reputation precedes you. I'm going to be teaching from God's Word today in Philippians chapter 4. I would encourage you to have your Bible open or your app and be ready to take notes from what God's Word is going to teach us. And Pastor Jeff did ask me to introduce my family, so let me introduce my first ministry to you. We have a photo of our family we're going to bring up on the screen. Um, Friends, maybe I can come back and teach about what to do when you feel like God is giving you the silent treatment. My wife and I, we struggled with infertility for five years, so let me just encourage you to be so careful what you pray for, church family, okay? (laughs) Um, Because God answers prayer. Uh, We now have five wonderful children. Lily Faith, who's in this service, age 12. Justin, who's in both services this morning, nine and a half. And then would you just take a moment and silently pray for the children's ministry this morning? Because they have the triplets back there, Abel, Ryder, and Jackson. Our names are literally gold-plated at the Costco in Katy, Texas, because we were buying 700 diapers a month at one time, church family. They don't give you a manual for these things at Texas Children's Hospital. They just give you a good slap on the back when you leave the NICU with triplets. Uh, But they are indeed our, and of course, uh, my mate, I married a superhero, Audrey. Audrey, you're in the second row. Would you just wave and would you welcome my wife, Audrey, who's here today? We live and base in Richmond, Texas, and our ministry is Christian Thinker Society, and we are dedicated to helping all of God's people be a Christian thinker. A Christian thinker is not an oxymoron, church family, and yet for some I think it is, uh, and it shouldn't be. And so the vision of our ministry is to join forces with churches that take the Word of God seriously. And this is where we had the privilege, I had the Sunday off last weekend, and so we worshiped here. And did you hear what Pastor Jeff said about the church? He's worried about the church. And it is so refreshing uh, to be in a church that takes the Word of God seriously, that teaches the Bible book by book, verse by verse, the way it should be taught. Uh, and so I'm following right in that fashion this morning, but our ministry is dedicated to helping every one of you love God with your heart, your soul, and your, and the, and your mind. What is the great commandment? Do you remember the nomikos in Matthew chapter 22, the experts in the law, the grammatus, the scribes in Mark 12, they were trying to trap Jesus with a question and they said, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And there were 613 commands to choose from in late Second Temple Judaism. And do you remember how Jesus responded? Let's say it out loud together. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so we take that very seriously at Christian Thinker Society. We produce content constantly to help you with the difficult questions that you face, taking those questions to a God who is a big boy who can take them always finding our answers from the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation. And so that, I would encourage you to check out christianthinkers.com. We have a prayer card available for you if you want to pick that up at the back. Um, And friends, I just want to tell you, wow, this has been an interesting experience. Um, I'm preaching this morning, and I'm going to give you some background of it. I have the privilege to teach the greatest anti-anxiety passage in all the Bible this morning. And before you leave, you're going to learn three things from God's Word about how you can, in your family or in your business, or like someone I just met who has a big decision to make, or someone who's concerned about their child who's walked away from the faith, or somebody that is concerned with a health challenge, or they've just had waves of challenges, you are going to learn the first three steps to living 
the shalom of Almighty God. That's what you're going to walk out of here with. So make sure you stay with me. The text is Philippians chapter 4. And I have found great peace the last 19 months in the Word of God. And I'm going to get to that. But I've also found a lot of solace and humor the last 19 months. I mean, none of us have been okay the last 19 months. Have you checked out the hashtag quarantine fail lately? Uh, You ought to check it out. Um, In fact, all of us have become YouTube do-it-yourself experts. I bought a chainsaw. That is a lot of fun to have a chainsaw. Um, Here's someone who did a do-it-yourself project from YouTube. They decided to build a kitty door. There it is, kitty door install. Um, And then when he showed the final result, let's see what the final result was. LOL, I hate myself. He put the kitty door on the top of the door. (laughs) Quarantine fail. Um, I'm reminded that my wife is saving us about $3,000 a year right now because we've taken on home haircuts, by the way, so there's five boys, so uh, I think she's, I've been reminded of that because it's Christmas season, I'm getting the hint, but here's someone who had a quarantine mishap when he was cutting his hair. He said, not a joke, my clippers just died, (laughs) quarantine fail. Uh, but perhaps the best thing that I saw in this, in this hashtag, and by the way, friends, I say this only to compliment all the educators in the world, in, in the room, especially the homeschool educators. I have much to learn from you. Uh, I have two masters and a PhD, and I was losing my mind during home learning with our kids, okay? I loved this note that a fourth grader held up to the camera uh, during their class remote session. It is not going good. My mom is getting stressed out. My mom is getting really confused. We took a break so my mom can figure this stuff out, and I'm telling you, it is not going good. (laughs) Quarantine fail, and that certainly resonated with me. Um, But in all seriousness, all of us are struggling. It's very normal if you're struggling with either low-grade or high-grade PTSD as we emerge from the pandemic. In fact, there's an article that has summarized a compilation of the mental health studies that have been done in the last 19 months. The Journal of Globalization and Health writes that all of the studies reported symptoms of mental trauma, such as depression, mood swings, irritability, does this describe any of you? Insomnia, post-traumatic stress, and anger. And get this, friends, something I just noticed a few weeks ago that experts are starting to discuss, something that I, that's passionate about my, in my heart about the church, there is now a viral spread of panic. They call it an anxiety contagion. And it turns out that panic is as contagious as any other pathogen. Did you know that? We're living in a time when the church is described by fear and we should be described by faith. Amen? It's dangerous in its own rights. And of course, mental health experts have now announced we're in the midst of a pediatric mental health crisis. And this is where I thank God for Woods Edge Church because Woods Edge Church models the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ made no distinction between mental pain and physical pain. Did you know that? He made no distinction. He healed them both. He spoke to them both. And Woods Edge is a leader of the pack because so many churches, congregations, We have suffered in silence and felt like lepers. Anytime the word mental illness or mental pain comes up with, it's like the church can't step back fast enough. Why is it when we bring up mental pain, there is a deafening silence? And friends, there shouldn't be. And we're living in a day and age too where you can be led by panic if you want to, or you can be led by the shalom of God. Let me teach you from God's word how to live in the peace and the shalom of Almighty God. We have to eliminate stigma. And of course, stigma is that wonderful Greek word stigmatos. By the way, it means tattoo in Greek. Did you know that? We need to, as a Christian church, rise up because the job of the Christian thinker is to clear the way, clear the obstacles for evangelism. And so if you're a Christian thinker, you want to make sure you have a faith that's conversant, that's translatable. Not to use big words that no one understands or concepts that are abstract, but to explain the gospel in such a way, like Blaise Pascal said, make people wish it were true and then show them that it is. That's our job. 
C.S. Lewis really summed up, and by the way, um, I went to see it on opening night with Audrey and Lily Faith and Justin. If you haven't seen the new C.S. Lewis movie, Most Reluctant Convert, totally recommend it to you. But Lewis, even in his day, felt the stigma related to mental pain. He wrote this, you may be familiar with this quote if you've read The Problem of Pain. Mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It is easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. And friends, I know there are a lot of broken hearts all over the room today. And those of you watching online, and I want to speak shalom to each and every broken heart. I want to teach you this morning how you can get on the path to healing. I want to teach you this morning how we can attack anxiety on the basis of spiritual truth. Paul had to develop a protocol, a treatment plan for the gripping anxiety in his life. And we are going to read Philippians 4, 6 through 9 here in a moment. But I would not be doing justice to the passage as a teacher of God's word if I did not remind you how ironic it is that the New Testament's greatest warrior, the New Testament's professional warrior, the Apostle Paul, gives us the greatest anti-anxiety passage in all of the New Testament. How can I say that? Well, if you if you jot down 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, this is in the midst of Paul's second missionary journey, which, by the way, was a total disaster. Paul has an opportunity, and I, I want to ask if you can relate to this. Have you ever had an opportunity, it was a great opportunity, the Lord was in it, but you missed it because you panicked, or you had anxiety, or you couldn't make a decision, and you just know that that was a missed opportunity from the Lord. If that's happened to you, I can think of a very specific time it happened to me where God had opened a door, and I didn't take the step of faith when I should have at the time. Well, we meet Paul in AD 55. He's writing a letter called 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, remember, the Apostle Paul has so many problems, and he has so many challenges in his life that people don't think he's an apostle. <laughs> How could God be with someone who had so many challenges in his life? In fact, he admits in verse 12 of chapter 2, Now, when I went to Troas, I want you to hear this, to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. So this beautiful city on the Aegean Sea, Troas, God has opened a door. But what does verse 13 say? I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus. He was waiting for Titus. Titus wasn't there. He didn't take his opportunity. He didn't take his step of faith. And he missed what the Lord had for him in Troas. And interestingly enough, he leaves and he goes on to Macedonia to the city of Philippi. Now, here's what we miss if we don't study the scriptures verse by verse, and if we don't study the Bible in context. Because remember, my job this morning is to help you read the Bible with first century eyes, even though we answer 21st century questions. Paul took seven years to figure out how to deal with the crippling anxiety that he faced in his life. Let me give you some more context. I can say this on the authority of God's word. Paul had four different experiences of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. We can speculate, we can actually add three more experience through speculation. Pastor Jeff will be there next week as he closes 2 Timothy when Paul says, the Lord stood by me. There was that experience on the ship where an angel tells Paul they're going to be okay. So there were some other experiences where we can speculate, but we know for sure that Paul saw the Lord Jesus Christ four times. And get this, he heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 12. So Think about this for a moment. If you saw Jesus four times and heard Jesus speak to you, and you still worried, that was the Apostle Paul. So you're in good company if you're a professional worrier, or if you're struggling with knowing the peace of God this morning. And so that's why we're, I want to set up the context. It's ironic then, seven years pass. Paul does something, when I get to it in Philippians 4.8, that is so powerful, you could only do it under the agency of the Holy Spirit of God leading you to write the Word of God. Paul is able to summarize Habakkuk chapter 3, Psalm 37, Matthew chapter 6, all in 32 words in Philippians 4.8. 
He literally summarizes the greatest faith passages in all of the scriptures. He would have been an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. He summarizes all of those in 32, 32 words in Philippians 4.8. So let me introduce you, reintroduce some of you to an amazing word called shalom. Can you just say it out loud with me? Shalom. It's translated 70 different ways in the NIV Bible. In fact, this word shalom shows up 550 times in scripture. It shows up more than the word grace. Did you know that? Shalom literally encapsulates the gospel of Jesus Christ for us. And I love it because we actually have it for you on the screen. The definition, it means peace in a sense that is far more than a truce or an absence of war or an absence of conflict. In the Hebraic sense, it's completeness. It's flourishing, it's wholeness, it's lacking nothing. Uh, if we have any Irenes here today, that's based 94 occurrences in the Greek New Testament, Irene, peace in Greek. But in the Hebraic sense, Paul had figured out the peace, the shalom of Almighty God. It took him seven years, and he gives us a step-by-step -step plan in three very important points that will bring peace to whatever situation you're facing. Now, it's important for me to teach how the Word of God explains peace. Paul is not doing academic theorizing. Paul makes it clear that we can have trouble and conflict in our life and still have the shalom of God. Did you know that? In fact, 12 times in the book of 2 Corinthians, and remember, Paul is referred to as the Job of the New Testament because he had so many challenges. He actually says in 2 Corinthians 1, I have the sentence of death within me. I despair. So perhaps you're here today and... You feel despair. You're in good company because the Apostle Paul was there. So 12 times he said he, that he had trouble. What did Jesus say in John 16, In the world you will have what? Say it out loud. Trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, he says in the same breath. And so God wants to show you how even in the midst of interpersonal conflict or challenges, and we try to do what the scriptures say in Romans, we live at peace with all people as long as it's up to us, then we leave the rest to the Lord. How can we have the shalom of God? How can we live in the shalom of God and still experience and overcome and transcend our troubles? That's what we're looking at. Well, Jesus personifies shalom. We learn shalom by first looking at Jesus Christ. Let me make this very, very clear at the outset. There is no shalom. There is no peace apart from Jesus Christ. There is none. In fact, when we look at the Old Testament prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it describes our day and age when those prophets would say, you look for peace, peace, where there is no peace. And do you know what the problem is with some of you? You're looking for peace in all the wrong places and you're not finding it because you have not found Jesus Christ. And you will never find peace until you surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. That is step one. Paul had to surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ in his life. He had to say something interesting. I die, how many times? I die daily to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We could spell shalom, J-E-S-U-S. -S. So shalom, theologically and practically speaking, is always connected to Jesus Christ. That healing, forgiving, loving relationship that Jesus won for us on the cross. Friends, it penetrates every aspect of our life. It penetrates our life spiritually and physically and mentally and emotionally. But with shalom, there is a divine order for us to have the peace of God in our life or whatever troubling anxious, worrisome situation that you face today. There is a protocol for it, and it took Paul seven years to figure this out. What is the protocol for peace? Well, step number one, make sure you get this. Number one, we will never have the peace of God until we have peace with God. The scriptures are so clear, that is the divine order. Romans chapter five and verse one, therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through what? Our effort, through our religion, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it say in Ephesians? For he himself is our peace. And so the shalom of God happens first and foremost when I have peace, the peace of God. 
If I don't have peace with God, I'll never have the peace of God in any situation in my life. And so it's so important that when I want to speak to the religious people here, there are a lot of religious people that need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You need to stop your religion and you need to understand the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he paid for your sin in full on the cross, rose from the grave physically, bodily, three days later to not only free you of your sin, not only to make you an adopted child of God, but to bless you with his shalom in every area of your life. So have you made step one in your life? I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you have been confirmed or taken a religious master class. I'm asking, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You will not have the peace of God until you are, have peace with God. Paul makes that so clear. And then here's the promise. Once we have peace with God, this is where it gets exciting. We begin to experience the peace of God. That's Colossians 3.15. That's Philippians 4.9. We talk about the peace of God and then the God of peace. So Jesus personifies this for us. I think of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Let me give you a great example of one way you can check how you're doing with the shalom of God in your life. It's a great check for us. I want to show you a tweet. My friend Caleb Kaltenbach and I spoke uh, a couple weeks ago in Dallas. He sent out a tweet that was a total joke that people went wild with, and here's what the tweet said, Costco has Bibles for sale under the genre of fiction, hmm. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. Um, this is really interesting. This was a total mistake that Costco made that day. Have any of you ever made a mistake in your job? I, I've made a mistake in my job. Maybe that person was like working a double, and the Bibles got placed next to Harry Potter on the book table in the, in the fiction section. The CEO of Costco, who is a devout believer in Jesus Christ, came out and immediately apologized, said this was a mistake. We fixed it that day. It didn't matter. A certain Christian provocateur came out with an op-ed that Costco, the Bible is fiction. How dare Costco? This is a slap in the face to all Christians. Boycott Costco. Pause right there. Jesus' most countercultural trait. How did Jesus personify shalom in his life? Jesus Christ could not be provoked, friends. The number one way that we can begin to live the peace of God, do we stand for truth? Absolutely and unapologetically. Do we do so in love? Absolutely and unapologetically. Do we preach the entire counsel of God's word? Absolutely and unapologetically. But I, can't, I need to realize there is an entire machine out there that is trying to provoke me every time I open my computer, every time I turn my phone on, every time I turn the news on, there is a machine trying to provoke me. And Jesus' most countercultural trait was that he was unprovocable. That's how he began to live shalom. And so since he was, un, he was unprovocable, he evidenced the peace of God. The shalom of God personified Jesus' ministry. And what's really cool, it began to then anchor the ministry of the Apostle Paul. We give you the, the word occurrences of shalom 550 times. Um, so how do we experience it? What are the, what's the protocol for peace in our life? Because Paul goes from struggling with crippling anxiety in 2 Corinthians 2.13 to giving us this power-packed anti-anxiety passage. It's so interesting because peace is always a gift of God rather than humanly devised or achieved. So it is a gift from God that we receive when we put certain things in place. Let's see what the Word of God has to teach us today. By the way, John Stott, that great preacher in London, he said the battle of the Christian life is the battle of the Christian mind. Make no mistake. And Paul is getting ready to use military metaphors as he describes the battle for your mind. You will think 6,000 thoughts today. Many of those thoughts will be intrusive thoughts. You will touch your phone 2,000 times today. And before you go to bed, you will have, te you will have seen 10,000 media messages full of lies. And it is now up to you to own the peace of God the shalom of God through the discernment of your, the indwelling Holy Spirit within you, you have to own it. You have to live it. You have to learn it. So what are the three points that Paul gives us? Let's begin at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says this. This, is, this verse is one of those interesting verses as a Bible reader. I wouldn't believe it if, I, if it was not in the word of God. 
It's one of those verses that you take a second guess at. It's like, is that, could that really happen? Could that really be the case? I wouldn't believe it if it wasn't in God's word. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. <laughs> this is a commandment. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then here's the promise of verse 7. And the shalom of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, there's that military term, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is really interesting because Paul would have known, um, because he's in prison, the Praetorian Guard in Rome was 9,000 soldiers. He would have had that in his mind. He'd already spoken to the Philippians earlier in the book about how the gospel was passing through even the palace guard. And so he uses that military metaphor, and so therefore our minds are a battleground, and they need to be protected by Dr. Jesus. And Dr. Jesus gives us this great prescription for peace. So number one, how can I begin to live this shalom of God, this peace of God in my life? Make no mistake, shalom happens when I have a plan. Make sure you write this down. Shalom happens when I have a plan. Living the shalom life, living the peace of God is a discipline, friends. It is not a talent. It is not something you're born with. It is not a spiritual gift. I wish I could sit up here with a Nerf, Nerf gun with peace pellets and just pellet you with the peace of God. I can't. The peace of God is a discipline, and it is something that we have to learn. It's really interesting. If you want to do a great Bible study, go through and underline all the words for learning just in Philippians chapter 4. Paul had to learn the peace of God. I had to learn it. Look at Philippians 4, 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me. I think it's down then again in verse 11. He, says this, he said, I know what it is. I have learned. I have learned. I have learned. And only then can he do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Now, everyone look up here at me. I want to share something with you on the authority of God's word. It is God's will for you to live in peace and shalom. It is God's will for you to live in peace and shalom. It is God's will for you not to worry. It is God's will for you to turn your worry and your anxiety into prayers. And so we have this multifaceted command in Philippians 4, 6, we're to rid our mind of certain things. And then in Philippians 4, 8, as we're going to see in a moment, we're to fill our mind with certain things. And you can do it, and you can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen someone, they just, they just illuminated the peace of God, and you're looking at them? I have been in situations with men and women of God when things are crashing in their life in certain areas, and they're steady. They have the shalom of God. Do you have that? Here's the problem, though. And this is where the sermon was made for me first. What are you doing, Dad, to produce peace in your family? Have you taken a moment and written down your shalom plan for your family? What is your peace plan for your marriage? What is your peace plan for your children? What things are you saying no to in your life for the bigger yes of God's peace? You know, there's some great practical things that we can look at. Uh, let me give you some practical suggestions of things that will steal your peace. Let's check these out on the screen. You have to learn to manage the anxiety and the stress in your life. Here's a great suggestion. Number one, stop obsessively checking the news. And all God's people said, amen. Check your scroll. Check your sources. Huge. I could give you example after example of Christians that made disastrous decisions based on false information. Doom scrolling is a huge problem. Don't contribute to the panic. Now, friends, by all means, speak truth, and speak truth with love, but let's not contribute to the panic. Isolation, um, this is really something I've been studying. Isolation is the worst punishment for a human being. Did you know that? And so let me encourage some of you with this. You need to be around the people of God. You need to be in physical proximity with the church of Jesus Christ. That could be a Bible study. That could be a gathering of Christian friends. But if you are isolated, make no mistake, it is going to be very difficult for you to live in shalom. And let me speak to those of you who are watching online. 
if, unless you have a medical necessity that keeps you away, and by the way, this is no shame. This is a no shame zone. Unless you have a medical necessity that keeps you away from people, which we completely understand, you need to be among God's people. And we all know that there are individuals who have used this pandemic who do not have a medical reason to stay isolated. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. Did you know that? Where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, he is there in the midst. And so let me just affirm you, as you're able, safely, find your group of God's... And that's going to look different for my wife, who has five kids and triplets, and we haven't slept in five years since they were born. You know, that's going to look different for the retiree who has time to read three translations of the Bible. You know, it's going to look different. But find that place. Don't let yourself become isolated. Leave the house. By the way, number nine, cheapest therapy you can have today, go jog two miles. It'll do the same thing uh, in your mind hormonally that great talk therapy will do, okay? So great, great suggestions. Can I give you another one that's not on the board if you're going to have a peace for shalom, if you want to have peace in your life in shalom? Don't make a decision when you're discouraged or exhausted. Don't make any important decisions when you're discouraged or or exhausted. Get some rest. Ask the Lord James 1.5 for wisdom and for the peace of God as you make decisions. So we see that Paul turns his anxiety into prayer. Do not be anxious for anything, every circumstance, every situation. And then we get to point number two. And by the way, um, this is so powerful. Make sure you write down Psalm 42 and 43. Our worship team sung about this. Even when I can't feel it, you're there. Even when I can't see it, you're there. Do you know that's Psalm 42 and 43? By the way, in the original Psalter, that was one psalm. And let me just summarize Psalm 42 and 43 for you. Are you ready for it? I believe it, but I don't feel it. I believe it, but I don't feel it. Here is the awesome application that I had to learn. It's so cool when you write a book because you get to learn so much about the peace of God and you live in it. Guess what's interesting? Because we live in this weird world where we allow our feelings to guide every decision we make. You know, I'm not vibing you right now. Have you heard this before? I mean, someone said, you're not vibing me. Um, I'm not feeling you right now. Um, do you realize if you apply that logic, your life will be a complete roller coaster if it is not locked down to the truth? Now, listen, I love emotions. I, I love emotions. I ugly dad cry when I watch The Chosen on TV, okay? Like, I'm an ugly crier. I, I love to cry. I want emotions in the car of my life. I just don't want them behind the wheel. Amen? The problem is, so many of you, you're allowing your feelings to guide you instead of the facts of faith. Psalm 42 tells us, you cannot listen to your heart. You have to preach to your heart. The worst thing you can do is listen to your heart. Somehow, at one of these stores, we bought something that said, follow your heart, and I looked at it in the wall, and I told Audrey, that's the most unbiblical statement I've ever seen. We need to throw that thing in the trash can. If I listened to my heart, I wouldn't even be here today. What does the psalmist do in Psalm 42 and 43? Why are you downcast, my spirit? Why are you so low within me? Put your hope in God. He starts preaching to his heart. So that's Psalm 42 and 43. The application is I cannot listen to my heart. I have to speak to my heart. I, my task is to focus my heart on the truth of God's word. So again, we appreciate feelings and emotion. Let's have them in the right lineup behind the facts and faith. Number two, how can I live the peace of God? How can I go out here today? So I need a peace plan. So right now, I hope you're thinking in my mind, okay, I've got to go, I've got to go update that peace plan for my life. Number two, I will not have the peace of God unless my life is bolted to the truth. Would you say the word truth out loud with me? Truth. Paul loved this word. Paul uses this word 55 times in his epistles. Truth, truth, truth. He kept using it. What did Jesus say in front of Pilate when Pilate was trying to provoke him? Everyone who is ectes aletheus in Greek, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The truth. Definite article, the absolute truth. So peace comes. So this is it. I don't know how he does it. I know he was an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. But in, in verse 8, there are 32 words. And there is one verb, ladies and gentlemen. And this verb personifies our ministry, Christian Thinker Society. There are 32 words. 
There are six adjectives. There are two nouns and one verb. And guess what the verb is? Guess what your, guess what your tool is to have the peace of God? It is the word think. Think. Focus. Logizomai in Greek. Reckon these things to be in my life. So peace comes through thinking about truth. And then internalizing that truth and then acting on that truth. It's really easy to preach it. It's harder to live it. Amen? So today, as you see those thousands of messages, you're going to have to process those through the filter of truth. He says, first and foremost, I think it's fascinating, whatever is true, think on these things. Focus on these things. It's powerful, and I don't know how he does it, but he summarizes, as I said, Matthew 6, Psalm 37, and Habakkuk 3 in 32 words in Philippians 4, 8. It's powerful. Peace comes then through thinking and trusting, through action, not through inaction. You know, the worldly psychology wants you to go on a vacation and escape your problems. Biblical psychology, which I thank God for, wants you to run straight into your fears with the truth of Almighty God and absolutely bulldoze them in front of you. So many of us, our church has become defined by fear. Our faith has become defined by things we're afraid of, the boogeyman, when we have the truth of Almighty God, and we need to live it. Every time you experience anxiety, here's a great practical check. Please take any any lies that you may be leaving. Check your anxiety and immediately misbelieve those lies and replace them with truth instead of believing those lies. You might have to do it 500 times today. That's okay. Now, friends, there's a lot of confusion about truth, okay? Um, I I want you to see this slide up here. This is a Bible scholar. So even among, this is why we have to be careful in churches and among Bible scholars. This is a book called Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Um, This rocked biblical scholarship in the 1970s. It's still cited today. Um, And this is why my heart as a ministry goes out to churches and Bible scholars who need to preach the truth of God's word. Do you see that index, truth, comma, ultimate? Can you read that? Truth, comma, ultimate. There's three page numbers. And guess what? All three page numbers are blank in the book. So even among Bible scholars, there seems to be confusion about truth. The truth is found in God's word. Amen? Amen. That is where the truth is found. I love Tim Keller's quote. He says, there's a stupid piece and there's a smart piece. (laughs) The Christian piece is not by making yourself stupid. It's by making yourself as aware of your beliefs, as thoughtful as possible. And so how are you working on that? So again, I develop a plan for shalom. Number two, I make sure my life, my marriage, my business, my family, we are bolted to the truth of God's word. And then It's so important that we make these decisions in church right now, not until we have an ethical or a moral decision to make later on a business trip or in a relationship. That's why services like today are so profound. You walk out of here saying, I am going to live according to the truth of God's word, whether I can feel it or not, whether I can see it or not. Let me give you a personal illustration, if I may. Um, We have a recent picture of our triplets, and I think it's appropriate to share this Um, because my wife and I have been married by God's grace for 17 years. These are our triplets. Abel is on the right, Jackson is in the middle, and Ryder is on the left. And I want you to take a special note of Ryder on the left. Now, I don't know if we had, I think we had like a substitute sonogram guy the day we went in when we found out we're having triplets. He had no personality whatsoever, no charisma. We went in the sonogram and he literally went A, B, C, one, two, three. And I thought, is he singing a Michael Jackson song right now? He went, baby A, baby B, baby C, you have three heartbeats. Well, Audrey just immediately began to physically shake, and I just started laughing, okay? And then they wouldn't answer any of our questions about what it was like to have a triplet. By the way, I met another triplet dad in the church, and he has survived, praise God. So that has given me hope going out in the future. Audrey and I wait weeks for an appointment at Texas Children's Hospital, maternal fetal medicine expert. We were so excited because, again, when you're a high-risk pregnancy um, they won't answer any of your questions. So you wait for that specialist. My mom is with me in the appointment. Audrey's in the center. In the first 10 minutes of the appointment, we're told that Ryder on the left is sharing a placenta with Abel on the right, far right, 
and it's very likely that they'll develop TTTS, and she goes into about 80 things that could go wrong, and then she asks us, this is where truth and biblical worldview come in, would you consider a fetal reduction to use a cultural euphemism of abortion? Now, here's what's amazing about being, when your life is bolted by the truth. Audrey, here in the second row, didn't have to stop and have a conference with my mom or with me. It's amazing when you have a spirit-filled wife who has made the decision long ago, my life is bolted to the truth of God's word. She looks straight at the doctor in the most loving spirit and said, I don't need to hear anything else. We will trust the Lord. And that was our first appointment. And 33 weeks later, she carried those boys in what Texas Children's Hospital said was a textbook pregnancy. Praise be to God. So friends, <laughs> praise God. I share that as an illustration, and I like to use that. You cannot wait until the appointment or till the business decision or till the moral decision to figure out if your life is, live, is, live, is, is bolted to truth. Some of us, we have no peace because we have not made that decision. Yeah, we're a Christian, but truth is kind of wishy-washy in our life. Until you fall in love with the truth, it's not until then will the truth set you free. Quickly, point number three, we have to make the decision then to live by faith in God's promises, not in explanations. I will not have the peace of God when I'm constantly asking the Lord to give me an explanation for the problems and the challenges in my life. You know, it's interesting when we study the great heroes in scripture, in 2 Corinthians 12, Jesus gives Paul no explanation for why he will not heal his thorn in the flesh. Isn't that fascinating to you? In John 11, Jesus gives no explanation to Mary and Martha as to why he waited four days and let Lazarus die. God gave no explanation to Habakkuk why he was decimating Israel uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar. God doesn't give explanations. Guess what God does when you're going through a challenge? He says, keep your eyes on me. I'm going to give you a greater revelation of myself. So, Lord, help us to have faith in your promises, not in explanations. Do you know how many promises there are in God's word? I document this in my book, Unimaginable. Are you ready for this? How many promises from God to you in the scriptures? 7,487 promises in God's word from God to you. You need to lock on to them. There's a promise in God's word for every, promise you're fa every problem you're facing today. So we're going to live by faith in God's promises, not explanations. All the heroes of Scripture lived by faith in the promises of God. Now, since this is my first time preaching at this church, I want to encapsulate and ask for your prayers for our ministry. Um, and I want to show you an image that you may want to take your phone out and get a picture of, because it's really the calling of our ministry. How many of you know that sometimes we have to be saved from ourselves? I do. Let me show you a picture that personifies shalom and the peace of God. Um, I, we used to live in the UK, so I followed the United Kingdom news. We were, I was flying over there. This is Golders Green in North London, one of the busiest intersections in all of the United Kingdom and North London. You know if you try to cross the street in Britain, pedestrians don't have the right of way. You'll get killed if you try to cross the street. The, that's contextually important because this gentleman had come to a place where he wanted to take his life, and he had gone to some effort to get over to the other side of the bridge. And he was going to end it. And for some of us, when I look at this picture, we can think of someone who's close to us right now and our heart goes out to that person. What happens next can only be described as the shalom, the peace of God, because strangers, people that don't know each other who are also walking home from work at that time, collapse on this individual. They grab him. They save him from himself. You don't think God is providentially in control? Someone had a rope going home from work that day and lassoed the man. Check out the guy on the bottom. He has his arms. Or, I've got his calf muscles. Do you have him up there? Yeah, I've got, I've got a hold of his belt. This guy, meanwhile, trying to push away, trying to end his life, listening to the lies of the world, the lies of Satan, doesn't want to do it anymore, and I love that man, whoever that person is with those brown sleeves, I've got you, I've got you. Wood's Edge, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our job right here. I need to get more sensitive to every person in my life who's struggling 
and I need to unleash the peace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ because we're going to meet people all week. They're going to pass us in the stores and at lunches and traveling, and we don't know it, but God does. They're on the edge. Raise your hand with me if you'll be committed to pass the shalom of God on this holiday Christmas season. I want to see these hands if you'll commit to be someone, not a Pharisee, someone who's going to pass the peace of God. I want to close this way and ask every gentleman to look up here at me. I want to pronounce the peace of God on you for the men, of, the men in this room. Men, if you'd look at me as a brother. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 the Lord of peace himself be with you in every way. Women, can I ask you to look at me, if you would please, sisters in Christ? I want to pronounce a blessing on you of John 14, 26. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. My peace I give to you. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the shalom of Almighty God. I pray right now for those that are here whose hearts are breaking. Father, we think of a son or a daughter, grandson or granddaughter, a coworker, a spouse, someone in our family. Father, our hearts are breaking for them. God, we need your shalom. We need a fresh touch of your peace. We need the peace that passes comprehension and understanding. We pronounce that today in faith on this church. Father, if there's anyone here today who it might be religious, but they've not come to faith in Christ, I want to give you the opportunity right now. I cannot forgive you of your sins, but I can lead you to faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you want to make sure that you have peace with God, that is step number one. We do that not through a meritorious work, by, but by simply trusting and what's been done. The gospel is spelled D-O-N-E, done, finished. Sins paid in full. The only condition is your faith locking on to Jesus' final work. So if you want to know for sure that you have peace with God, you can pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And right now, by faith, I place my trust in you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of my sin for peace with God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of you would say, Jeremiah, I need the shalom of God in a specific area in my life. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you, please? All over this room so I can pray for you. Raise it high. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. All these hands, hundreds of hands. I need the shalom of God. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I need the peace of God. I need the shalom of God. Yes, we see all these hands. I'm going to ask you right now to commit to do exactly what this verse says. In the quietness and the temple of your heart, would you just turn that anxiety over to Jesus right now, like Philippians 4, 6 says? Do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. Would you take a moment and just turn that anxiety to the Lord? Some of us, it's, Lord, heal my broken heart. That's been my prayer. Some of us, it's someone. We see that bridge. Turn it over to the Lord. Father, we turn these burdens into prayers, these anxieties into praise. We ask now that you would do only what you can do, fill our hearts with the peace of God, the peace that passes understanding. And then, Lord, as you fill us with peace, let us do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, be agents of shalom, agents of comfort to others who so desperately need it. In the powerful name of Jesus, we all pray and all God's people said together, amen. Shalom.